look very clear on my computer. It doesn't look quite so clear on a big screen, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to see it all okay. Um, first of all, um, it's great to see you all here, and uh, thanks very much to John and his colleagues for giving me the opportunity to present uh, some of our research to you today. What I'm going to do is um, start off talking a bit about the research, uh, some of the broadly accepted climate change impacts, look at some of the implications of those for health and well-being, uh, and see where health and social care fits into the picture. Um, I'm going to take a bit of a look at how government policy provides the context for climate change and public services. Uh, and then I'll move on to looking at a few case studies of how people in different areas of the country have addressed these issues uh, and end up with some, con with some conclusions. Before I do that, um, if I can, there we go. Um, as John mentioned, uh, I'm a researcher with the Association for Dementia Studies. Uh, some of you may not have know much about us, but we are based in, in the Institute for Health and Society. Um, we're a team now of, about, of, of over 20 people working across research, training and education, and we're very much focused on working in partnership with a range of organisations um, and making sure that people with dementia and their families are informing everything that we do. Okay, I'll tell you a bit about the research on which this presentation is based. I should actually say, uh, first of all, that this is research that I carried out before I moved to Worcester. Uh, so it was um, some research that was commissioned uh, for the University of the West of England. Uh, and uh, I guess it was about three years ago that this research actually took place. So it was commissioned by the Department of Health uh, through the social care Institute for Excellence, and it was largely driven by growing concerns about um, the impact of climate change and global warming on public services in general, uh, and the fact that up to date, most of the research had been around, and most of the activity in fact, had been around climate change and health services. Uh, social care had been fairly largely ignored. There were three parts to this work. We started off with uh, a mapping exercise looking mainly at policy, uh, government policy around climate change and public services, um, but also a range of strategies and initiatives that were going on in the UK at that time. We followed that up with some case studies uh, where we had identified specific initiatives that were going on around the country, and I'll be highlighting some of those later on. Uh, then we from that work we developed some key themes and recommendations for, particularly for commissioners of adult social care in the UK. Okay, let's have a little look then at some of the facts around climate change. Many of you will be more familiar with these than I am. I'm a social scientist. Some of this stuff is fairly alien to me. Um, but we do now have an annual climate change risk assessment in the UK, um, which quite usefully identifies the projections and the risks for the coming year. So the predictions are that average global temperatures will increase by 0.2% per decade, uh, and by 2100 will rise by between 1.8 degrees and 4 degrees centigrade. Um, and I think it's important to stress that these are long-term predictions. Uh, we're looking at nearly 100 years, so between now and then, there will be fluctuations. So some of the impacts then, which I guess we're already seeing, um, increased summer and winter temperatures, more winter rainfall, less summer rainfall, more heavy rainfall. Uh, we've had quite a lot of that recently. Uh, rising sea levels and increased extreme weather events such as heat waves and flooding. 
In addition to that, uh, there's this urban heat island effect where urban areas are more susceptible to heat rises than rural areas. Moving on then to look at some of the implications of those changes uh, for health and well-being. There are, there's quite a lot of being work, work being done by the Health Protection Agency around what these changes in climate might mean for our health and well-being. So they're predicting increases in uh, a range of diseases, particularly respiratory diseases, skin cancer, uh, and food and waterborne diseases, which obviously have major implications for our health and social care systems. Also, more widely, uh, increases in flooding have a, have a wide range of social impacts, uh, which are particularly significant, I think, for our social care services. So we're talking about um, problems with employment, mobility, mental health and relationships, uh, and various other things as well, resulting in potentially a wide range of social and welfare problems that we need to take into account in our planning of service delivery in the future. So for example, in the 2007 floods, um, which I'm sure you remember uh, hit Tewkesbury very badly, nationally 50,000 homes were affected by that particular extreme weather event. Um, and prior to that, there was a heat wave, which you might not remember now, but there was, in August 2003, uh, which led to 2,139 excess deaths in the UK. So fairly big impacts, even at this you know, fairly early stage uh, as a result of climate change. There's also some benefits, uh, which we probably shouldn't ignore. Uh, so potentially, a reduction in cold-related deaths, and due to changes in the weather, an increase in outdoor physical activities, which, uh, as you can imagine, could have some benefits in terms of physical fitness and reduction of certain diseases. I think it's also important to, to stress that climate change and its impacts don't affect everyone in the same way. There are certain social inequalities which come into play here. This is a quote from the World Health Organization, um, which I hope you can read okay. I won't go through the whole thing, but as you can see, the extent to which we are affected by climate change is dependent on a number of social and economic factors, including income, social status, employment, and education. There's some really good work being done on this by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Um, and they've, they've uh, got a whole program of work about inequality and climate change, which you can see on their website. And they're focusing on what the main factors are that impact on experiences of climate change. So we're looking at um, personal and social factors as, uh, as well as environmental features and how they impact on different parts of society. And in terms of the World Health Organization work, they've identified a number of other factors, air pollution, housing, quality, residential location, and occupational conditions. And all these things are closely related to these personal and economic factors that I mentioned. I want to move on now to, to say a bit about where health and social care services fit into this picture. Now there is a growing awareness, uh, although it's been fairly slow I think, of, in, in academic and political circles of how climate change might impact on public services generally, um, and particularly services for, uh, for older people because they are the main users of many public services. And much of the focus has been on the NHS so far. Uh, as you can see here, um, there is fairly good quality information about the impact of the NHS in terms of possible carbon emissions. Um, so 21 million tonnes of CO2, CO2 per year, it is estimated, are admit, emitted by NHS-related activities. Uh, that's mainly around transport and procurement. 
and that represents 25% of all public sector greenhouse gas emissions. This, these figures all come from the NHS Sustainable Development Unit, which was set up by previous Labour government, um, but has now been, uh, well, it no longer receives government funding, so it, it has a, a much smaller role now than it did in those days. Now, much of the, we need to distinguish here, I think, between mitigation and adaptation in terms of how the country responds to climate change. So mitigation is about reducing the likelihood of climate change, mainly by reducing carbon emissions. So in the NHS, there's been quite a lot of work around this, particularly through the Good Corporate Citizen Initiative, to which um, I don't know what the latest figure is, but a large number of um, NHS trusts have signed up to this. And it's around monitoring and reducing carbon emissions, largely around these six different areas. So I've already mentioned travel, there's procurement of um, equipment and medicines and so on, facilities management, so about, about how the buildings are managed and made uh, environmentally friendly, workforce issues, um, part of that is around making sure the workforce have uh, alternative means of travel to work, community engagement and building. So six main areas in the NHS where this um, mitigation work has been taking place. In social care, as I mentioned, there's been much less focus on this and that's partly because of the complexity of the social care system. The annual spend on social care is around £16 billion. Um, and that's spread among 13,000 provider organisations with nearly one and a half million employees. So it is very difficult to put into place any strategy or initiative that can uh, address that very complex system. And that's why this particular piece of research was commissioned largely, because there had been no focus on social care. I mentioned mitigation. The other area is adaptation. So that's about changing the way services are delivered and the way individuals behave in, in, in order to reduce the impacts of climate change. Um, so things like heat waves and flooding and how they affect us. Taking a look now at the context in terms of government policy, we, as, I, as I said, we did a, a fairly comprehensive mapping of uh, government policy and strategy. Now, under New Labour, there was a fairly um, well-resourced focus on climate change and public services. It was largely on um, mitigating the effects. So, this is a summary of some of the policy themes that we identified from our mapping work. Um, there were some fairly innovative um, pieces of legislation here. There was the Climate Change Act, of course, in 2008, uh, preceding that document called Securing the Future, and a whole range of initiatives here. Um, just to pick on one, the Carbon Reduction Commitment Energy Efficiency Scheme was uh, a scheme that encouraged all um, public services over a certain size, and that would include NHS trusts and, so, and local, cap local authorities, to reduce their carbon emissions and to reward them financially for doing so. So much of this is focused on mitigation, changing the way that services are run to reduce their impact on climate change. Now, that was under the Labour government that came to an end in uh, 2010. This is a quote from the coalition government. Uh, who branded themselves right from the start as the greenest government ever. And this uh, fleshes out in a bit more detail their aspirations in terms of climate change, recognising that it's one of the gravest threats uh, and that urgent action is acquired, required nationally and internationally, and setting out a number of ways in which they would uh, address the issue. But if we look at what's actually happened since then, it probably doesn't quite live up to that rhetoric. 
So, for example, they have abolished uh, a number of environmental indicators that have put in, been put in place to monitor carbon emissions. They set out 29 low carbon commitments uh, at the beginning of, of the coalition government in these broad areas that are, that are listed here around support for international climate change action, promoting energy efficiency, supporting renewal, renewable energy, and so on. Now, the Green Alliance carried out an audit of these commitments uh, in 2011 uh, and found that progress had been good against seven of them, moderate against 16 of them, and had failed against six of them. Um, so not a glowing report there, I think, and uh, that was now two years ago, so it may, it may be uh, even worse by now. The coalition government have also abolished a range of environmental indicators, and I think quite crucially, they changed the energy efficiency scheme so that now any savings that public services make, uh, they're not financially rewarded for. Any savings actually go back to the government, uh, which is obviously uh, much less of a motivation for organisations to make those changes. I think it's fair to say that many of these changes we've seen under the coalition have been driven by their um, policy to move a lot of action to a local level, to decentralise and to encourage demographic engagement by local communities. Um, and that, you know, that's probably an admirable goal in terms of climate change. Local communities are in the best position to decide what their priorities are and what the most appropriate actions are to address the impacts of climate change. Unfortunately, I think the role of local authorities who are responsible for social care in particular um, around that has been very ambiguous uh, and certainly they haven't been resourced to take on this new role. And that's borne out, I think, by, the, uh, by a, a survey that was carried out in 2011 which uh, identified that 37% of local authorities were deprioritising climate change action uh, and that action was absent or weak in 65% of local authorities. I've got a number of case studies here that indicate how um, local communities have addressed climate change. I probably haven't got time to go through all of them, so I'll select a few. Um, Cornwall County Council, some of these examples are regional, some are much more local, but they all have been attempts to address climate change in terms of both mitigation and adaptation, and particularly around the delivery of local services. So Cornwall, Cornwall County Council, for example, have a uh, corporate strategy that embeds climate change at the very top level. They've got a range of tools that make sure that care is delivered in as environmentally friendly way as possible. Um, they encourage their staff to use energy efficient cars. They have green champions in every workplace who take a lead on climate change issues and try and encourage their colleagues to work in an environmentally friendly manner. Camden, the London Borough of Camden have um, been piloting a new way of commissioning services that, is, uh, that aims to be much more sustainable. So rather than just taking into account, this is um, a rather complex model of how the system works. Um, rather than taking into account the cost of services as the main driver of commissioning, they are now incorporating or giving equal weight to a range of um, sustainability outcome measures uh, and ensuring that People who tender for contracts uh, are organisations that tender are putting sustainability working practices in place, encouraging service user involvement, co production in the delivery of services, and so on. As I said, I won't go through all of these. Um, this is a particularly interesting example. Time together, Gosinan. Gosinan is a suburb of Swansea. And there, the local authority is leading on an initiative to completely change the way that social care is delivered. 
um, so that it is led at a local level by service users using methods such as co-production, um, time banking, uh, and so on, so that services are much more sustainable, delivered locally, etc. It's a very bold model, I think, uh, and it'd be very interesting to see uh, how successful it is. I won't go through all of these, but I can certainly provide further information on those to anyone uh, who, who would like it later. To conclude then, um, I think there is fairly convincing evidence that climate change is going to have a big impact on the way our health and social care services are delivered. Local based community initiatives do seem a very sensible way forward to delivering services, but they do require a high level of resourcing, clear roles and responsibilities, uh, and fairly bold and innovative leadership, I think, at a local level. Where they are successful, they can result in a sort of triple win situation in terms of protecting the environment, saving money and producing a range of social benefits. So they are a clear, clearly a, a gold standard um, that I think we should be aiming for, but we do need to make sure that they have government support, even though they're being delivered at a local level, uh, and that there is good sharing of information about the processes and resources that are required to make these kind of initiatives work. Thank you very much for listening.